Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to my second talk here at PGConf EU 2023 this year. This talk is about PostgreSQL replication, and I've come up with 20 pitfalls and solutions that you maybe should be aware of. My name is Julian Markwort. I'm a senior database consultant at Cybertech. We do PostgreSQL consulting, support, remote DBA, and a lot of other custom and more non-custom stuff, whatever you need, basically. So the motivation for this talk is that we consult on, deploy, and administrate a lot of PostgreSQL clusters, replicating clusters, so that includes binary replication or logical replication. And we get confronted with really a lot of replication problems on a regular basis through the support team and so on, which I'm also part of. And so the PostgreSQL is not that bad as it, this might now sound. We just end up with a lot of problems because a lot and a lot of people are running replication. So it's not by it by itself. Usually it's errors by humans or by automation. It is often just wrong assumptions or misunderstandings. Sometimes it's misleading or missing documentation. And very seldomly, it's really a bug in PostgreSQL itself. By the way, I've uploaded the slides already. I hope that went through just a minute ago. So if you want to double check them, you can find them on the conference schedule. So we've identified 20 common pitfalls, and we'll go through them one by one. I'll introduce any concepts that might not be completely obvious um, as we go by, and I'll outline solutions for each. The talk is mostly aimed at raising awareness about these problems, not about deep diving into any of them and discussing them until you're all bored. But you can come up to the booth and discuss them until you're bored, if you want to. So the first section of pitfalls is wall-related pitfalls. What is wall? Wall stands for write-ahead log, which is where PostgreSQL stores all the changes that all the transactions do, the transaction log. This is because, no, I won't get into the details, just all the changes are stored there. So PostgreSQL writes the wall to ensure that it can become consistent again after crash recovery, to ensure that crash recovery is possible. We only need crash recovery, well, we always start crash recovery at the latest checkpoint, so we only need to keep the wall of PostgreSQL just for the sake of crash recovery, only needs, to, needs wall to cover this distance to the latest checkpoint. And it can recycle, delete any wall that is older than that at least if there are no other special conditions that we'll get into now. So the very first problem is this recycling, and binary replication is just continuous recovery. So we're not just talking about crash recovery, but about continuously applying the wall, these changes to catch up or to keep up, and continuous recovery, or basically all kinds of recovery, crash recovery, point in time recovery, only work if there are no gaps in this wall. It's, I think it should be quite obvious that we're keeping binary changes, and if there are just some binary changes not present, then all the other binary ch uh, changes need to be considered invalid. So we would stop at every gap. And if the primary recycles any wall that the replicas still need, it, the replicas can no longer replicate over this gap and cannot catch up. So the solution here is the easiest one is just to use the um, wall keep size setting. You can just specify an amount in megabytes, gigabytes, maybe even terabytes, whatever you think is um, enough to cover most of your expected downtimes of replica, network interruptions, maintenance tasks. So look at how much wall you're writing maybe in half a day and put that in wall keep size and that will keep most of these troubles away from you. The second option is to use replication slots, and the third is to use archiving. And coincidentally, these two points bring us to the next pitfalls. The first is archiving. So what is archiving? The wall is split into 16 megabyte segment files on the disk, and as soon as PostgreSQL is done writing to one of these files, it switches to the new one instantly and calls the archive command on the old one at least if an archive command is defined and if archive mode is enabled. 
And if the archive command returns success to PostgreSQL, it indicates, uh, if it indicates success, then PostgreSQL has the ability to take this um, wall file at any later time and recycle it, delete it. It will not delete it right away because it most likely needs it for the crash recovery still. And um, conversely to the archive command, we can define a restore command that can be used for replicas or even for point in time recovery to get wall segments um, requested by their identifier from this central wall archive location. And there are some issues with archiving. The first one is obviously that this can just fail. Maybe you have wrong permissions on the archive command script itself. Maybe something is broken, maybe the disk is full. It can also simply be too slow. If your network is slow, the latencies to make a connection are too slow. This is quite critical often because the archiving is strictly sequential. So PostgreSQL starts archiving the first file. Only when that is done, it thinks about archiving the next file. So if you have 10 seconds of connection latency every time, that's quite bad. And so when archiving is stuck, PostgreSQL, the primary, cannot clean up that file and obviously not any subsequent ones. And this can quickly lead to out-of-disk space situations. So you need to definitely monitor your archiving. There's a view for that in PostgreSQL. And you should make your PG wall mount large enough, again, maybe to cover a few hours at least. And you should also make sure that you can increase this PG wall mount in a hurry, at a whim, maybe using logical volume management or whatever. Because if your database runs out of disk space, the simplest solution is to make PG wall larger, usually, and restart. Third problem, now the replication slots. What are replication slots? Replication slots can be created manually, so by your administrator or what, what you have, by your failover tool, by PG-based backup, and a lot of other things as well. And the replication slot is an object to keep track of replication progress for each of the replication connections usually. So the replica will continuously regularly advance a restart LSN that is tracked in this replication slot object. And this logical sequence number, the LSN, this is what the abbreviation is for, um, identifies the point at which the replica could start requesting wall again if the replica suddenly crashes or um, loses the network and needs to start replicating again. And because the primary needs to keep all the walls since that restart LSN for all the slots, this can also quickly lead to out-of-disk situation, especially if there is no replica connected to your primary that continues to advance this restart LSN. So you need to monitor your replication slots. Again, there's a view for it here. And you could use the max slot wall keep size setting to limit how much wall PostgreSQL will keep for any given replication slot. But again, if you exceed this amount with your replication slot, then you're again stuck at the point where you might have gaps in your wall when you're trying to recycle, so keep that in mind. The best option is usually to use both replication slots and archiving, in my opinion. Then the fourth pitfall is that replication slots themselves are not replicated. So this means if your primary breaks down and you promote a replica, this replica has no concept of the replication slots that were available on the primary. So if you rely on replication slots to ensure that, for example, your change data capture tool will get all the changes that happen while your database is running, while your database cluster is running, throughout the failovers and so on, you need to make sure that the replication slots are actually already on the replica before you switch over. And there are some, um, some fixes, some hacks, for example, in Petroni, where Petroni will just copy the data um, for the replication slots that are, is on the primary, copy it to the replica, and so then as soon as it promotes it, the replication slots are already there. There is also the PG failover slots extension, which is being talked about in another room, but please don't leave. And perhaps a feature to replicate replication slots will be added in Postgres 17. 
The next pitfall is what I call the parameter dance, which is due to some allocations that are based on some parameters that we passed to PostgreSQL before we started. All of these parameters need a restart to apply them to your database. And the most important one that most people stumble across is max connections. So why is this important? This is important because the replica needs to re create, replay, reconstruct all the um, transactions, all the logs and so on that are running on the primary. And to keep track of all of them, it needs the same space in memory. So all of these arrays need to be sized at least as large as on the primary. So you need to keep these values as high or higher on your replicas. And starting a replica with too low settings will fail. So you need to keep in mind that when you increase these values, you need to increase them at the replica first. And if you want to decrease them, you need to decrease them at the primary first. Now we get to switchover related pitfalls. What are switchovers? Switchovers um, happen every time you take your primary and you gracefully bring it down and promote a different replica. And switchover usually also, um, well, if we talk about switchovers, we also need to talk about failovers. A failover is just when your primary database crashes or it is um, disconnected by a network partition. So both of the, uh, all of these pitfalls apply to switchovers and failovers. The most important thing to consider is the split brain. You should always only have one primary in your cluster because PostgreSQL does not have a concept of multiple primaries. It cannot merge transaction log from two primaries and reconcile them. So if you happen to come up with two primaries and you accept changes on both of them, um, you have conflicts that you cannot resolve, at least not in a programmatic way easily. There are no tools that I know of really that help you reconcile that. And the, this slide has all the problem and the solution in one. Um, you need to double check that your primary is down before you promote your replica. And just because you cannot see the primary any longer because it's partitioned off in another data center and you cannot connect to it, does not mean that it's not still running as a primary and not still accepting local changes. So you need to be very aware of this. You should analyze how your high availability manager solution handles this. And I think it should use something like locking, where you can only promote if you acquire a lock that is backed by a quorum. And so that means if you can acquire this lock, nobody else can acquire this lock, so nobody else should run through the logic of promoting. And at the same time, anybody that loses the lock, any primary that loses this lock or fails to extend its lease on the lock, um, would have to shoot down the primary PostgreSQL instance to ensure that there is no split brain. Next pitfall is about timeline switches. Timeline switches happen every time you promote a replica. So let's say your replica is on timeline one, you ask it to promote, it will switch to a new prime timeline, which is usually just one increment from the previous timeline. And so let's construct a case here where node A is the primary, it's running on timeline one. Node B is a replica. Right now it's also running on timeline one, it's continuously replicating. So node one would write into its transaction log records one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it crashes. And only records one, two, three, and four made it to node B. Only those were replicated. So now your failover tool or you yourself decide to promote node B and you end up on timeline two on node B with, and your node B starts accepting new writes, new transactions, and these result in records five, six, seven, eight, and nine, for example. And then you restart node A or it restarts automatically. So you probably want to at least reconnect node A so that it can replicate from node B again. But the problem is that node A still has these records five, six, and seven on timeline one. These are different records. They, they have the same record number, which by the way, I'm, I'm simplifying things. This is the, an abstraction from the logical sequence number. Um, these 
same numbers contain different changes on the other node. So we can only reconcile this because we cannot merge the transaction log. We can only reconcile this if we somehow make node A undo these changes, 5, 6, and 7, so we can reconnect it as a replica. So because PostgreSQL only has a redo transaction log and not an undo transaction log, it can only move forward from any point. And there is no way using the transaction log alone to undo these changes. So what you can do, the simplest solution is just grab a new copy of your data directory, you run base backup again, and this is easy, foolproof, but a little bit expensive in terms of I.O. and bandwidth. So if you get into multiple hundreds of gigabytes, perhaps it's worth considering some alternatives. One of these is PG Rewind, which will identify a point of divergence by looking at the wall contained in both of those instances, the primary and the replica that you want to reattach. And it will find the point of divergence, yeah? and analyze the transaction log for all the blocks that have been written on both instances in the meantime. And it will copy all of the blocks that might be different on the replica compared to the primary. We don't really know. This is because of the um, updating of the table files on the disk only happening asynchronous usually. All the changes are just persistent written to the transaction log. And so when PG Rewind is done reconstructing all the blocks, we can start recovery of our replica again at this point of divergence and tell it to follow the switch to the new timeline. There are some switchover implications for auto vacuum, and this is that some things are not replicated for performance reason. So this includes the st statistics collector, so pgstat user tables, and a lot of other pgstat tables that you might already know. And these are things like usage counters, so updating them and storing them consistently and durably and re replicating them is slow and not necessary for consistency. So um, pgstat user tables and similar views are what AutoVacuum relies on to estimate how many tuples are in the tables, how many tuples have been updated since the last AutoVacuum. Does it need to run AutoVacuum again or not? So since it uses this data to decide when to AutoVacuum, it's a problem when this data is gone. And this data goes away every time you do crash recovery. And so then it's also not available on your primaries, uh, on your replicas, that you create it from a base backup, because taking a base backup and starting it is basically like starting from crash recovery, as far as PostgreSQL is concerned. So the solution is to run analyze after a switch over, at least on the tables that do not get picked up by auto vacuum itself. This usually is uh, tables that are very large and have a small part updated very regularly. And you need to monitor your auto vacuum and table bloat, but you do that anyway, right? Next pitfall is a transaction loss after failover. So by default, PostgreSQL does not wait for any feedback from the replicas when, it's, when they are replicating. And so it's quite possible that you accidentally re, um, promote a replica that has not received all of the transactions. And so the solution is to make sure that you only pre promote replicas that don't lag too much. Some high availability tools like Petroni have a countermeasure against this built-in. Or you could use synchronous replication. Synchronous replication is another pitfall in itself. Um, so let's say you turn on synchronous replication. Well, the first issue you realize is that the commit latency rise, commit latencies rise. So you tell the application team to deal with it. You want consistency, you need to deal with the cost of it. Um, then you encounter an issue where your replica is gone. It's not able to confirm the, um, the changes, so you cannot commit any longer. All your transactions are stuck. What can you do? You can add a second replica so that you can take one of them down, do some maintenance or whatever, or one of them can fail, and you still have another one to send the feedback. 
And maybe then eventually you do a switchover, failover, well, switchover, not, but a failover, or your automation tool does a failover. And then after the failover, you look through the logs and it tells you, for example, Petroni does this. Um, if you define, uh, configure it to do so, it does the PG rewind automatically if needed. So why was there a need for PG Rewind when you were just using synchronous replication? Well, the issue is that synchronous replication is only concerned about the commit records. So only when your application decides to permanently commit a transaction, only this commit record is synchronized. Only for this commit record, the primary waits for the feedback from the replicas for which it is configured to wait. So all of the changes in between, which might be changes from auto vacuum, but also just running inserts, updates, deletes of a long running transaction before it eventually would have tried to commit, all of those might still be lost. And all other records are asynchronous and it's even possible for clients to specify that they want to be asynchronous in a cluster that is otherwise, otherwise configured to be synchronous. Now we come to read-only replicas related pitfalls, which is about, um, well, let me start a bit. So read-only replicas is you, you have a replica, and in PostgreSQL it's possible to start a replica in such a way that it can also accept reading queries. This is called hot standby. And sometimes this is used for, for various reasons. Maybe you want to do a read scale out, you want to um, send your reads to other replicas, or maybe you have some specific cases like data analysis, business intelligence, things that you want to, one, want to run on a replica where those long running transactions don't bother the primary workload that you're doing. And so the first pitfall is about the consistency between primary and replica. And there are several different um, cases here. So in asynchronous mode, it's quite possible that you will not see some data on the replica that you've already committed on the primary that you can already see on the primary. So if you switch between them back and forth, you might not see it on one, but see it on the other. And in synchronous mode, it's even possible that a user connected to the replica can see a record while the application that wrote that record on the primary is still waiting for the feedback. Maybe you have another replica for which feedback, for whose feedback you're waiting for, and this has not sent the feedback. So really, consistency is a bit of a mixed bag in um, PostgreSQL replication. Again, because the synchronous replication is only concerned about um, the commit transaction, uh, the commit record, and the feedback about this. Synchronous commit in PostgreSQL does not have anything to do with two-phase commit, where such issues would probably not show up. So what do you need to do? You need to monitor your replication lag. You should only consider replicas healthy for reading from if they don't have any lag, or at least not any relevant lag. And you should also try to have your application stick to the same replica, uh, to the same instance. So if you're doing an update, do the con uh, consequent writes on that same primary instead of switching to a replica right away. There are some vacuum um, related conflicts in replication. So the issue is, or the outline is that replay on the replica can be blocked by open transactions on the replica. So you might be wondering, how can there be conflicts? There is no way to write data on the replicas. So we all know MVCC, um, the concurrency control, so readers are never blocked, right? But the issue is that um, every transaction on the replica has a snap, well, every transaction in general has a snapshot um, an information which versions of rows it would like to see or could potentially see and which it cannot. And of course, you have these snapshots on the replica as well. Now, the issue comes up when the primary decides to run auto vacuum and it wants to clean up some old row versions, some tuples that cannot be seen by any of the transactions, any of the snapshots running on the primary. 
because this is what PostgreSQL is by default only concerned with what's running on the primary. So you have some long-running transactions on the replica. They might not even be so long-running, and they still want to see some of those old snapshots, some of that old data. And now it comes in the change, this auto vacuum. I want to remove these old tuples. And now you have a conflict because auto vacuum, applying this auto vacuum change, wants to remove row versions that your snapshot on the replica would still allow you to see. And so there's a trade off between delaying the replication. Um, or the delaying the application of changes, um, or, well, this is what we then would say is allowing the transactions to finish, or um, killing these transactions and just continuing with a wall replay. By default, this trade-off is set to 30 seconds. So from the point at which a change comes in to the replica to the point at which it must kill any conflicting transactions, you have 30 seconds. And so even if you have transactions that are shorter than 30 seconds, it's still possible that you run into this issue. And there is one solution or a few solutions that you can use. Well, the first is um, do not use replicas that you configure to run with an indefinite delay as candidates for your switchover. So you can take one replica, dedicated straight, just the way, of, sorry, dedicated only to um, analytic queries where you have maybe hours of runtime, hours of transactions, and never consider this for your high availability solution. This is one option. Because if you do not, um, do not obey this and you have a replica that has delayed applying a lot of transaction log and you decide to promote it, it needs to, at the point of promote, it needs to apply all the changes. And applying changes roughly runs at 20 gigabytes a minute. Um, so if you have really a lot of changes that you need to apply in the moment of the promote, you might be waiting for some time. There is another option, which is to use hot standby feedback on the replica. And if you use hot standby feedback, the replica will tell the primary which old snapshots it still wants to see, so that the, replica, uh, the primary can take this into account when it starts auto vacuum. This means that the primary will not be able to remove as many old rows, as many dead tuples as it would like, so you're slowing down the progress of auto vacuum a bit. The next pitfall is about prepared transactions and recovery. Maybe this doesn't apply to everybody because prepared transactions by default are not allowed in PostgreSQL. Prepared transactions is two-phase um, commit in PostgreSQL. And these prepared transactions need to be crash recoverable. So they are wall locked. They will survive crash recovery, switch over, so they, they are replicated to the replicas, and if you promote the replica, this prepared transaction is still there. And you need to ensure that your transaction manager, the um, piece of software that is uh, responsible for creating these prepared transactions, is aware of this and that it can manage this, that it can recover from such cases. And actually, there was a bug in, um, in the recovery of prepared transactions when you were starting a replica in hot standby mode in PostgreSQL 13 and 14, which I identified with the help of a colleague and got um, backported into 13 and 14. So if you're using current versions of that, you're all fine. And this only was possible um, to occur when you had a prepare statement just in the very last wall segment before your crash happens or your switchover happens. The next pitfall is that maybe you have your replication configured, but hot standby doesn't seem to work. You cannot connect to the replica. You cannot ask it any queries. This is because the hot standby feature um, requires the replica to know which transactions are currently in flight on the primary, to know if it can see some row versions to reading queries on the replica, or if it cannot show them. 
And the primary regularly writes an X log running X acts record into the transaction log, and so this is also replicated. And this contains all of the running transactions. And if you start a replica back up, or if you do crash recovery, you can only start hot standby mode if you have, well, the PostgreSQL instance can only go into hot standby mode if it has seen such a record since its minimum recovery ending location, which is a value that you can determine from PG control data. This is the point up to which changes might have been written to the data directory already. So we cannot go back any further before that. So we need to start at that point and need to wait for the next transaction snapshot in the wall. And so what's somewhat frequently, um, if all of your instances in your cluster crash, maybe there's a power outage that affects all of them, or somebody just shut them down all of a sudden, um, and you start all of them up as replicas in hot standby mode, and they don't have an xlog running exacts record in their wall after this minimum recovery point, um, they cannot open up to reading transactions. They will wait indefinitely for some wall to show up in their PG wall directory or for some wall to be sent to them that contains this snapshot. And al until then, they are not able to come up for reading queries. So if you encounter this, you just need to choose one of your instances, go by whichever has the highest logical sequence numbers, and promote this one manually. There is no other way you cannot look into it to check if it's healthy or not. You just need to commit, commit yourself to this action and promote it, and then um, it should usually work. There's a bonus problem related to hot standby, which is, again, that it doesn't work. It's not coming up. And this is, again, about this xlog running exacts record. And it only has space for a limited number of subtransactions. So if you have a lot of subtransactions in your primary database, this record cannot keep track of all of them. So it will have a sub-overflowed flag set. And as long as this sub-overflowed flag is set, the replica doesn't know how many, well, it doesn't know which transactions are running, but not which subtransactions are running. So again, it cannot come up for reading queries. And I've actually seen a case where I restarted a replica and it took until midnight when probably something happened in their application. Maybe a restart happened in the application. And only at this, this point, the replica um, was able to come up for reading um, transactions again. So I would advise you not to use any subtransactions. There are known performance problems when using subtransactions and re replication or at least don't use too many of them. Um, don't use save points in your transactions like they are free. And the same goes for um, the PLPGSQL exception handling, because every exception handler block also uses the save point feature. Every save point leads to another subtransaction being opened. And also don't have any long running transactions. So the subtransactions by themselves are fine, even if you have a lot of them. If you every now and then have a window where there are no subtransactions running or not too many of them, so that your replicas can come up again. And then we get to logical replication related f uh, pitfalls. Logical replication in PostgreSQL also relies on the transaction log being there because the transaction log is analyzed, is passed for the changes that the primary did, and then these changes are turned into logical changes that can be um, transferred to the logical replicas. So this also means if you need to read the wall on the primary to decode all those changes, you also need, you can also encounter all the transaction log related pitfalls like that the wall has already been recycled, you run into replication slot issues and so on. So the first problem to consider with logical replication is that you have co can have conflicts. In logical replication, you have two roles. One is the publisher, which 
is the primary source of changes, and the subscriber, which is getting these changes sent in from the publisher or requesting them and then applying them to its own data. And because these logical changes, they are basically just insert or delete statements, these need to be applied um, on a regular primary. You cannot run, um, you cannot have a subscriber on a read-only replica, that doesn't work. So at the same time, this means it's just a regular primary, everybody can write to it. So it's very easy to come up with write conflicts where somebody connects to the wrong instance, updates something, and now there is a conflict in between what the primary, the publisher would send versus what the uh, subscriber already has applied to its tables. And there is currently no conflict resolution in, in core logical replication. So really you need to make sure that nobody can write to your subscriber or at least only in a way where there will no, not be any conflicts. So maybe you could use a different role for your application that only has select privileges on the subscriber, but insert and update and delete privileges on the pri um, publisher, for example. There is also the pitfall of DDL trouble, data definition lang language trouble. So um, logical replication for the most part relies on your tables being the same, having the same rows, same row names, obviously. And so it's possible to work around some um, differences in your PostgreSQL versions where you can define a list of um, columns to replicate or which ones not to replicate. Um, but the DDL in general is not replicated in all, uh, at all. So if you run an auto table statement at the primary, at the publisher, the subscriber has no clue about this at all. So the best option is you don't ever change your schema at all. And if you absolutely have to change your schema at all, you need to be very sure that this will not result in a blocking of the logical replication. Because, for example, if you have a um, column missing on the replica, you add a new column to your publisher, and this is not yet there on the subscriber, then the logical replication will not know what to do with this record unless you configured it to ignore any new columns. So in this case, you would have to add the column first to your subscriber before you add it to the publisher. The 18th pitfall, and I hope you're all following along and um, looking forward to the end, but, but not too much so, um, is about long-running transactions and snapshots. So when you create a logical subscriber, you usually start with an existing table, a table that already has contents at the publisher. So you probably want to copy all of those existing records from your publisher to your subscriber, and logical replication can do this for you. Um, and because you don't want to miss any transactions between the start and the end of this copy, copying this process, um, you need to... Um, Sorry, now I get lost. Um, because you need to keep track of all the changes, you need to export, create a snapshot on the primary first, snapshot that tells you um, which transactions are currently in flight. And to create the snapshot, you actually need to wait for all the previous transactions to finish and to... Um, and you need to keep track of all the new transactions that are coming in all the time, right? And if you have the wrong ratio, the wrong combination of long-running transactions that have not yet finished, that you need to wait for before you can export the snapshot, and you have a lot of quick, short transactions, it's possible for the snapshot to grow too large. You will get a message about the snapshot being too large, and at that point, the sync, the synchronization of the tables just needs to start right over. It has to, again, request a new snapshot and 
most likely it will run into the same problem if, if the long-running transactions don't go away. So don't use long-running transactions. <laughs> yeah, I have a slide for that. So then there is an interesting pitfall, which we've only seen once really at a customer, and then we looked for it on the mailing list, and it turns out somebody else has also con um, encountered this in the past. So um, this is about the max replication slot setting and logical replication. So if you add in logical replication, you don't replicate all the changes in your database cluster. You just specify which, or usually you specify which tables to replicate. You can also tell it to replicate all tables. And so if you start this initial sync, you will have to copy a lot of tables, and there are multiple um, synchronization workers that PostgreSQL on the subscriber can start to do this, to copy the data. This can be configured by max sync workers per subscription. And so the subscription itself creates a replication slot, and every sync worker creates a replication slot. These are replication slots that are created on the publisher side. And so you need at least one for the um, subscription itself and plus the number of max sync workers per subscription slots on the primary. And if you have any regular binary streaming replicas also connected to the primary or any other logical replicas, you will of course need to consider this and increase max sync workers, uh, sorry, increase max logical replication max replication slots is the setting that I'm looking for um, to accommodate all of them on the publisher side. But there's a weird thing about the subscriber because the subscriber needs to keep track of all the tables that it has already synced and it needs to report this sync state back to the publisher. And if you have a lot of small tables, it's possible that this reporting of the sync state does not happen quickly enough and you end up accumulating a lot of tables that have actually already been co um, copied, but this array will fill up. This array is sized by the max replication slots parameter. So what actually ends up happening is you only have a few table sync slots but you have a lot of tables that need to be synchronized. And if this array runs out of space, this initial synchronization operation will just fail outright. You have to start all over again. You have to copy all of the tables again. And so actually what you need to do is set max replication slots on the subscriber side it's not used to create any replication slots on the subscriber sites. It is only used to size these arrays that we need to keep track of the progress. You need to set it basically to be very safe for the number of tables that you want to sync in your sync operation. And now the last pitfall is about long running transactions and apply in um, PG PostgreSQL versions earlier than 14. So the problem there was, or it's still possible to run into this problem in newer versions if you don't know the right parameters, um, is that the output plugin, which is responsible for sending out the logical changes, can only send out these changes for a completed transaction. So if you have a long-running transaction, it needs to keep track of this whole long running transaction before it can send this out. And um, there are some parameters that define how much memory the output plugin can use to keep track of multiple transactions. If it exceeds this, it needs to spill to the disk. It needs to store this on the disk. And, that, and then at some point, the long running transaction finishes. And so the output plugin gets to shove the whole transaction to your subscriber. And if there are a lot, and a lot and a lot of changes in this long-running transaction, then it will appear as if your replication is somehow stuck. You, you will see no progress indication, really. 
it will seem as if the um, replication slot is not being advanced and so on. What you will see is that the apply worker on the replica is busy at 100% cranking one CPU core constantly. So this is most likely an indication that you're running into this particular problem where a long running transaction finishes and then all of these changes have to be sent to the replica and applied there. And the apply worker on the replica cannot do anything else at the same time as well, unless you have um, this parallelized as well. And since PostgreSQL 14, there's an option to stream logical changes. So now this um, keeping track of the ongoing transactions can actually be delegated to the subscriber. So we send all the changes for all transactions to the subscriber as soon as we can send them. And the subscriber now has to keep track of the long running transactions. Again, there are some parameters to configure how much memory the um, subscribers have available to keep track of this. And if they don't have enough memory, they will spill to their disk. But then it's already a problem at the subscriber. So you cannot run into the issue that you're that you have not, um, that you're not quickly enough replicating the other ongoing changes from the publisher to your uh, replica. And you can even now do this, this um, apply workflow in parallel in PostgreSQL 16. So PostgreSQL 16 and logical replication, I think you have to still tweak some settings. It can apply multiple transactions um, in parallel. So this brings me to the conclusion for now, which is don't use long running transactions. Uh, if you know the, the groundskeeper Willy meme, where he complains about that brothers and sisters cannot get along like Scots and Welsh and so on. Anybody know this meme? I wanted to, to have it here um, so that long running transactions don't get along with auto vacuum, they don't get along with lookups for which tuples are actually visible for your transaction. They don't get along with snapshots. And in the end, it turns out long running transactions don't go along very well with long run transactions and neither with replication in general. So I'm at the end now. Thank you. All right, we have time for maybe one question, but then we do have a break, so you're welcome to come up and talk as much as you'd like. Any questions? Maybe a quick side note while yeah. if somebody has a question, sure. Um, the, the side note is that there are many more pitfalls that I came up with and bonus pitfalls and bonus bonus pitfalls um, that are hidden here behind the say thank you slides. So if you're keen on that, do download the slides and look at those. I think they will be interesting to a lot of you. All right, thank you, Julian, so much. Thank you.